Okay, I want you all to stand up. You've been sitting too long. Okay, I'm going to have you do two things. When I finish the first one, I'm going to put my hand up. And when you see my hand up, put yours up and keep your mouth shut. And then I'll do the second one. First thing I want you to do is wander around for about 30 seconds and greet as many people as possible, but greet them in a special way. Greet them as if they're unimportant and you're looking for somebody much more important to talk to. So <laughs> greet each other as if you're unimportant. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Put your hand up. Stop what you're doing. Okay. Now what I want you to do for about 30 seconds is Greet as many people as you possibly can, but this time greet them as if they're a long-lost friend and you are really glad to see them. Okay. Okay. All right. You can sit down. You can sit down. All right. Now, why did I do that? Except I'm from California, uh, and we're going to bring in some hot tubs here in a little while. Uh, but uh, the reason I did that is that running a great organization is all about managing people's energy, including your own. Now, where was there more energy in the room, the first activity or the second? Second, significant. And what did I do to change the energy in the room? All I changed was what you were thinking about. From these are unimportant people and all to these are long lost friends. And the energy just went crazy. Now, how many of you know it's a fascinating thing that the mind and the computer have a lot in common? You know what they have in common? Neither the mind or the computer knows the difference between the truth and what you tell it. You put something in a computer, it doesn't say, Where'd you get those facts? Those facts are wrong. What does the computer does? It does whatever it can with whatever you give it. What have we said about the computer over the year? Garbage in what? Garbage out. Do you know that's the same way with your mind? If you woke up this morning and looked in the mirror and said, you're fabulous, your mind is not going to say, who are you kidding? I know you a lot better than that, you know? <laughs> and so one of the things that's really interesting is if we change the way people think we have an impact potentially on their behavior. Because did I tell you how to behave with unimportant people? No, very little touching, very little smiling, and all you just kind of, you know, I didn't say, well, you should do that. And then when I said, these are long lost friends, what happened? Your faces lit up, you started to hug each other and laugh and all. I changed your behavior completely by changing what was in your mind. And I'd like to do this now in a short period of time. I'd love to have you all day so you don't have to fool around with these other sessions. But uh, <laughs> is that I want to change the way you look at leadership. Because I want to tell you, the world is in desperate need of a different leadership role model. We've seen what self-serving leaders have done in every sector of society uh, all around the world. And what I have found is that the only leadership style that gets great results and great human satisfaction is servant leadership. And who was the greatest leadership role model of all time? Jesus. And I didn't know that. You know, a one-minute manager came out, and I wasn't even a believer. And uh, all of a sudden, boom, this is this best-selling book. And I get invited to the Hour of Power with Robert Shula in his heyday. And he interviews me in the book. And Shula says to me, Ken, I love the one-minute manager. But you know who's the greatest one-minute manager of all time? I said, who's that? He said, Jesus. And I said, Jesus? You know, really? <laughs> yeah, he said, he was really clear on goals. Isn't that your first secret, one-minute goal setting? Yeah. And he said, you and Tom Peters didn't invent management by wandering around. You know, Jesus did. You know, he wandered around from... One village to another, if anybody showed any interest, he'd praise him, heal him. Isn't that your second secret, one minute praising? Yeah. 
And he said if people stepped out of line, he wasn't afraid to give them a one-minute reprimand, threw the moneylenders out of the temple. Isn't that your third secret, one-minute reprimand? Yeah. Well, he's the greatest one-minute manager of all time. I went, Whoa, isn't that interesting? And so as I started to move along in my faith, I decided I better go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. I wanted to see what the man did. I'm looking for the red print, you know. And I started to laugh because everything I ever taught about leadership, Jesus did with these 12 incompetent guys he hired. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't have hired that lot. And because not only was a woman a manager, he was a situational leader. Those of you that know about that, he was a different leadership style on the, d the development level of people. And so when he first hired them, they were enthusiastic beginners. What do they need? They need direction. The first commission, what is it? He tells them where to stay, what to wear, what to do, what to do. And you see him over time move from directing to coaching to supporting. In the end of Matthew, what does he do? He says, go and make disciples. That was the only direction. You know, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, you know, boom. And just reminded them that he would be around if he needed them and all. But he just changed his leadership style as their capacity to do what he wanted them to do uh, increased. Now, he had to come back for a final visit, if you remember, you know, because they needed a little more work. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, so when I started to realize this, what I found out is that nobody was teaching about Jesus as a leader in the churches. They weren't teaching in the divinity school. And if you want to know what God wants to use you for, you can look at the, at the past and get a better idea because he was giving me a lot of notoriety and all that kind of thing. And when I was finally on his team, he could use me. And so we started a Lead Like Jesus ministry that's housed in Spartansburg, South Carolina now, and we're all over the world. And I want to tell you, people love Jesus all over the world. They don't like Christians. Uh, you know, we got too many Pharisees in Christianity. And, uh, but uh, they are blown away uh, by it. And it's, I think it's starting to unite people. I was telling a group this morning, I, I was over in India uh, a couple of years ago in Mumbai. We had 1,000 people in Mumbai for a one-day leadership, Lead Like Jesus encounter, sponsored by the Bishop of the Catholic Church. And his goal was to unite all the followers of Jesus around his love and stop arguing about our denominations and our thing. You know, we're the only religion who eats our own. You know, if we ever united everybody who loved Jesus together, we could really impact the world, forgetting about arguing about who has what and this and all that kind of thing. And so in the afternoon, our president, Phyllis Henry, was uh, there with me with my wife, and she gets up in front of this crowd, and she said, I realize we have every denomination going here. Besides Catholic, we have the Presbyterians and Episcopals and the Lutherans and this, and that. we had some Mormons and, and all. And so uh, she said, I'm going to say one, two, three, and when I say three, shout out your denomination. And so she went, and everybody did. Man, it was this terrible noise. And then she said, we're going to do this once again. And uh, <clears throat> when I say three, shout Jesus. And I want to tell you, it's just unbelievable. I'm going to try it with you. Let's just do it right now. One, two, three. Jesus! Jesus. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? I did that at the National Prayer Breakfast. I was the dinner speaker last year, and I got an ovation when I did because everybody was invited. I came from there uh, yesterday. Is invited in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Not Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, because every faith was there. And one of the Muslim leaders who spoke at lunch, he said, I hate to say it to you Christians, but Jesus didn't come just for Christians. And he would read something from the Bible, and then he would read the counter in the, in the Koran. He'd read something else and all. It was just unbelievable. And uh, so uh, what we're doing is teaching people that Jesus is the greatest leadership role model of all time. I was telling the group that I was doing a, a program with John Ortberg, a great pastor from Southern California uh, in Atlanta. And I said, John, why would you come all the way across the country to teach everybody that Jesus is the greatest leadership role model of all time? 
And he smiles. He's a great storyteller. He gets up in front of this group. He said, suppose you were gamblers 2,100 years ago. Now, I know some of you don't like to gamble and all that. But let's just assume, where would you have put your money on lasting? The Roman Empire and the Roman army or a little Jewish rabbi with 12 inexperienced followers? He said, isn't it funny? 2,100 years later, we're still naming kids Jesus, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and we name our dogs Nero and Caesar. <laughs> now, one of the things that we try to change people and lead like Jesus is that when we talk about servant leadership as part of that, a lot of people think that servant leadership is about the inmates running the prison or trying to please everybody and all, but they don't understand that there's two parts of servant leadership. There's the leadership part of servant leadership, which is about vision, direction, and values, you know, and goals. See, leadership's about going somewhere. And if your people don't realize <clears throat> where you want them to go, what's the chances of them getting there? And so that's the leadership part of servant leadership. And then once people understand what business you're in, what you're trying to accomplish, what your values, and what the goals are for that year, then what you do is you turn the pyramid upside down, and now this is the servant part of servant leadership, and now the hierarchy works for everybody who eventually works for the customers who what? Takes care of the whole organization. See, I want to tell you, all the great organizations that I have worked with that are number one in their industry, they all use servant leadership, and they might not call it, but the reason I know they do is that you know who they think their number one customer is? Their people. And they feel if they take care of their people and motivate them, love on them, train them and all, they're going to go out of the way to take care of the number two customer, which is the people who use your products and services, and those people are going to be blown away and they become raving fans of yours, they become part of your sales force, and that takes care of the third most important, you know, deal. That's the owners. And the problem with Wall Street and other places, they act like what? The reason for business is to make money. No, profit is the applause you get for creating a motivating environment for your people so they'll take care of your customers. And who does that? Southwest Airlines, the only ones making any money in the airline business for 40 years. Nordstrom's. Disney and entertainment, Wegmans and grocery, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Synovus and financial services, Toro, you know, and, and that machinery business, they all believe in servant leadership, and they turn it upside down. And when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and he turned the pyramid upside down, he was moving from vision and direction to what? Implementation. Now, he had kind of a slow group, so it took him a while to realize why he was here. But he finally got it, you know, Peter told him, you know, that he got it, you know. And then he turned it upside down. Now, when I talk to some people about servant leadership, they think, if I become a servant leadership leader, aren't I going to lose my title and my position? No, what did Jesus say right after he washed their feet? He said, you call me teacher, you call me Lord, rightly so. But what I have just done for you, do for others. And that's really the leadership part of servant leadership. And does it make a difference? You better believe it. And you can always tell <clears throat> an organization run by people with big egos, because one of the things that we look at in, uh, in Lead Like Jesus is the heart, which is your character. And we ask the question, are you here to serve or be served? And there, most people, if I said to you, are you here to serve or be served, I doubt if there'd be many people put their hand up and say, I'm here to be served. And yet, we might watch your behavior, and you'd act like you, all the brains are in your office, or, you know, or you're the brightest one in your family, or whatever, that kind of thing. And <clears throat> why do you do that when you don't want to? What did Paul say? Why do I do what I know I don't want to do? It's the human ego. That's when you edge God out. And you do that in two ways. One is false pride, 
when you think you are more than other people, I'm brighter, I'm smarter, and all that. Everybody knows that's an ego problem. But you know the other ego problem is fear of self-doubt. And people say, well, I didn't know that was an ego problem. Sure, what are you focused on? You're focused on yourself. And you're focused now on a less than. False pride is a more than, less than. I'm not as smart, I'm not as bright, and all that. And so we have a 12-step Egos Anonymous. I wish I had time to run an Egos Anonymous meeting here. I mean, it's fabulous. You see executives I get, they stand up and they say, hi, I'm Ken, you know. <laughs> and what do you all say if I was at an Egos Anonymous meeting? Hi, Ken. And then I say, I'm an egomaniac. And then we make them tell a, la a time in the last 48 hours when their ego got in their way, either with false pride or self-doubt. And we tell them, if you can't think of a, an example of the last 48 hours, you lie about other things, too. <laughs> because the reality is we all have ego issues periodically, but the more you realize how that takes you away from being the kind of leader or the kind of person that, e that Jesus wants, then you, like any addiction, you start to be conscious of it. I wrote a book called The One Minute Apology, so you can go apologize for things that you did were stupid uh, <clears throat> when you got your ego uh, in the way. And so it's, a, it's really, I have a lot of uh, uh, company presidents, every time they meet with their executive team once a week or once every two weeks, they start with an Egos Anonymous meeting. And boy, I tell you, it says brought them so close. And a lot of people say, God, I don't know if I want to change. Well, I wrote a book with Colleen Barrett, who stepped in to be president of Southwest Airlines after Herb Keller stepped down. She has a great saying, people admire your skills, but they love your vulnerability. And if you will admit to your people when your ego got in the way and you made a mistake and all, rather than them thinking less of you, they think more of you. And the way you get your ego out of the way, false pride, you get out of the way with what? Humility. And Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, you know, he studied these organizations and he wanted to find out what do great leaders do. And he found two characteristics. One is resolve, which is what? Determination to accomplish a goal, live according to a vision. <clears throat> and the second was humility. And he kept on saying to his research, that can't be the second most powerful characteristic of a great leader. And they kept on saying, sorry, Jim, that's what the data says. And so when I saw Jim after the book came out, I said, thanks for profiling Jesus. Because what, what Jesus resolved, man, he was going to Calgary no matter what, you know, even though he asked the Lord a couple of times to kind of let him off the hook. But uh, the, uh, and humility, he, he modeled humility. And so humility is a strength, not a, a thing. And so what people have to do, but when we see an organization that's run by people that aren't humbled, who have a big ego, they want to keep the pyramid alive and well for implementation, you know? So even if they have a clear vision and direction, they want everybody sucking up the hierarchy. And if you've ever dealt with one of those organizations as a customer, and you've got a problem, and you talk to a frontline person, you're talking to a duck. What do they go, quack, quack? You know, I didn't make the rules, quack, quack. I just work here, quack, quack. This is our policy, quack, quack. If you want to talk to my supervisor, quack, 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 you know? And they're quacking away, you know? I mean, Jesus had to deal with a bunch of quackers, didn't he? I mean, the Pharisees, a bunch of quackers. You know, how can you heal on Sunday? Quack, 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 you know? I mean, you know, poor Jesus walking around bare feet with all this duck doo-doo, you know? And, uh, and uh, so, I mean, it's just unbelievable. But if you really deal with an organization where they turn the pyramid upside down, now you're dealing with what? Eagles in the front line. What do they say at Nordstrom's? No problem. I had a friend that went to Nordstrom's recently, wanted to get a piece of jewelry for his wife, and the gal behind the counter said, we don't sell that here, but I know where I can get it in the mall. How long are you going to be here? He said, about a half an hour. She said, fine, I'll go get it and gift wrap it and have it ready when you leave. Unbelievable. He comes back, and she went and bought what he wanted, gift wrapped it, charged him the same price she paid in the other store. Nordstrom's didn't make a dime, but what did they make? A customer. A customer. Duh. I'm working on that book now. Duh. <laughs> Why isn't common sense common practice, you know? And uh, so it's really, let me tell you my great story about the difference between, because what you get there, you're talking to an eagle. What do eagles do? They soar above the crowd. 
they take it and run with it rather than quack, 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 quack. The eagle goes, I'll take care of it. Nordstrom's, they say, no problem. And so one of the examples, I should have brought it with me. When I travel, I have this thing I put around my neck. It's called my geezer pouch. You know, you get older, you forget things, you know. And uh, in my geezer pouch, I have my passport. I have, if I need it, I have my license. I have my ticket. I have a itinerary. I have, you know, pen and pencil. And I go around the yard, but what do you need, you know? And I'm trying to get my wife to get a geezer pouch because she can never find anything in her damn pocketbook. But... Um, <laughs> But one day I loaded my geezer pouch, and this was a couple of years after 9-11, uh, and uh, i pulling into the airport in San Diego, and I realized I left my geezer pouch on my desk at home. And I don't have time to go back home and get it. i got to get on this plane because I'm going to do a session for a company. And so the only book I've ever written, I got my picture on the front cover, is I wrote one with Don Shula, the old Miami Dolphins coach. They took our picture in Miami Stadium. And I ran into the bookstore at the airport. Luckily, they had a copy, and I bought it, see? And so fortunately, the first airline I had to go to was, was Southwest Airlines. And I'm checking a bag out in the street, and this guy said, could I see your identification? I said, yeah, I apologize. I don't have a license. I don't have a passport. I said, how is this? And I held the book up. And he looked at it, and he shouts out, this man knows Don Shula. <laughs> he said, put him in first class, you know? They don't have first class. They didn't even have business select then. And they're high-fiving me. They should have the man, no Shula. Oh, my God, you know Shula, you know. And there was an old guy there who said, I know the security guard's up there. I'll get you through there. So one of their people guides me through the line, see. So after I met Colleen, because I hadn't met Colleen or Herb at that time, I told her a story. She said, can we let our people bring their brains to work? Our person didn't assume you superimposed your picture on that book to get by them, plus the bigger issue is whether you got a weapon. And so we let them make decisions like that, duh. <laughs> now the next airline I had to go to before they could overnight my uh, thing was one of the big airlines and they're always talking about chapter 11 and all that kind of thing, you know, and, they're, <laughs> and uh, so, and, uh, so I show my book out at there, out in the street, and man, the duck doo-doo starts to fly, see, you know. <laughs> the guy goes, quack, you better go to the kitchen. The, the ticket counter, and I show it to the woman, quack, you better talk to my supervisor. We call the supervisory duck the head mallard, because they just <laughs> quack at a higher level. Have you ever seen them, you know? <laughs> and pretty soon, I'm talking to a guy in a suit and a tie, you know, and I started to give him a hard time, but then I realized he was a bureaucrat, and you can always tell bureaucrats, because they have very tight underwear on, and they, <laughs> and they, 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 they kind of waddle a little bit, you know? Am I able to talk like this in a church? I guess I can, but... Uh, but uh, so I had to change my line. So I said to him, what a difficult job you have. I so appreciate you taking me on. You know, I sucked up the hierarchy and he let me uh, go on the plane, you know. But I was very fortunate, you know. But you have to go through these gyrations with these ducks, you know, because the organization is set by self-serving leaders who think that all the brains are up the hierarchy, see? Where if you get these organizations, you know, that turn the pyramid upside down, then you really have it. See, did Jesus want us to turn the pyramid upside down? Why? Yeah, he wanted every one of us out there. What? Go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say, you know, wait till the pastor tells you. You know, Jesus didn't come here to start a church. He came here to start a relationship. We happen to put them into churches. And I'm the interim pastor, supposedly, of our church. Our pastor left, I was telling the group today. And, and uh, uh, I was told by a friend, you can always tell when God's talking to you because you, th you think it's something you never would have thought of yourself. And the second thing is, would the devil like you to do it? You know, and so I'm driving home or thinking one day, you know, now, our pastor left. He was a good buddy. He had been there 17, 18 years. And they're going to bring in an interim pastor, see, while we look for another pastor, see. And I thought, that's stupid, you know. And we had two great young pastors that nobody had ever heard that worked with a youth, a man and a woman. We had a great Egyptian pastor at an Arabic service for 150 people. Every Sunday, nobody had heard him. Great uh, guy. And uh, the only one they had heard is the executive pastor. And uh, so... I send a note over. I said, okay, you know, uh, why don't I be the pastor? And I sent it over to the thing, and I'm telling you, 
uh, the, the staff said, oh, God, that would be great, you know. But then they had to get it through the presbytery, you know. We're part of a group of churches, you know. And, man, they drilled our people for two or three hours before they said, okay, we'll let Blanchard come in, but he can't be the interim pastor because he's not ordained. So I'm the interim coach. <laughs> so, but when I came in, I, every five weeks, one of his preaches. I found out, I was telling the group this morning, why a lot of leadership doesn't occur in churches. If you've got to give 45 messages to the same audience a year, you have no time to, to lead. You're, you're creating messages, you know. So, but we do it every five weeks, and we have a ball, you know, because that's, that's a kind of easy every five weeks. But, but the point is that Jesus is the greatest leadership role model of all time, and what we need to do is do that. And so I've revisioned our church... <laughs> You know, I mean, our church is, you know, our purpose statement is to worship God by reflecting the love of Jesus as we serve and interact with each other and folks outside the church, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we have, our values are really, duh, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's love, grace, <laughs> integrity, community, and all. It's really kind of a, a fun thing, but you got to recognize, you got to first have it, and then you turn the thing upside down so that everybody has. And so we spent a lot of time teaching everybody about the values and, and the mission and all that so that they can, can, can do that because that's where the action is. And so in our Lead Like Jesus, you know, and you ought to all get involved. We have a book called Lead Like Jesus Revisited now. I think they have it at the store. It's our second version. But you can't lead like Jesus without Jesus. <laughs> and uh, so, but we look at the heart, which is your character, then the head, <coughs> which is your beliefs about leadership. And I talked about that because people are thinking, how can you lead and serve at the same time? They don't seem like you can do. You can if you know about these three things. And then we move to the hands, which is how do you implement all of this? And I'll just give you a, a wonderful example uh, that you can take back home and, and all, uh, I, I mentioned uh, we had looked at all the uh, master's degree programs and all, and they weren't teaching anything about leadership and, and uh, nothing about the heart. And so we started a master's degree program at the University of San Diego, a master of science and executive leadership with them. And in our first cohort about 15 years ago was uh, Gary Ridge, who had just become president of uh, WD40, you know, the squeak and clean group. And... Uh, he was wondering what he was going to do to turn the place around because they had a lot of fiefdoms going, you know, and people protecting their departments and stuff like that and all. And so uh, I told them about uh, when I was a college professor, I was always in trouble. I was investigated by some of the best faculty committees. Uh, and the thing that drove the faculty crazy is the first day of class, I gave out the final examination. And they say, what are you doing? I said, I'm confused. They say, you acted. I said, I thought we were supposed to teach these kids. You are, but don't give them the questions in the final. And I'd say, what do you think I'm going to do all semester? <laughs> I'm going to teach them the answers. So when they get to the final exam, they get A. Life's all about getting A. It's not some stupid normal distribution curve. I mean, do you have a performance review system where you have to screw a certain percentage of your people? You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean how absurd is that, you know? How many of you go out and hire losers? We lost some of our best losers last year. We need to hire some new losers to fill the low slots. <laughs> no, you either hire winners you steal from other companies or you hire people who have potential to win and you're going to train them. You're not hiring a normal distribution curve. Why would you do that? And Gary goes, duh. Why don't we do that in industry? And so we wrote a book about it called Help People Win at Work. You know, the subtitle is a business philosophy called don't mark my paper, help me get an A. And let me tell you what they do at WD-40. At the beginning of every year, every manager sits down with uh, their direct report. Now they call themselves the WD-40 tribe because the, to break up the, the things, he wanted us, the image of a, of a tribe and the chief teaching everybody, you know, and, and all. And so they are all tribe members around the world. They're in 30 nations. And... Um, so every manager sits with each of their direct reports, looks at the organizational goals first, then looks at their responsibilities, 
and then sets three to five observable, measurable goals. Goals have to be uh, measurable. If you can't measure something, you can't manage it. So a lot of people evaluate people on stupid stuff like initiative, promotability, you know, creativity. What does that mean? So people suck up the hierarchy to get a higher score. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You know, why would you do personality traits? I mean, you could do that. Suppose you say, I want you to be creative. What does that mean? You have to give at least one suggestion a month on how we can improve this department. In other words, I want 12 suggestions for you a year. Now you know how to get a high score on creativity. But just to rate somebody on some amorphous kind of thing is stupid. Uh, and so uh, I get kicked out of a lot of organizations. Uh, but uh, uh, And so... Uh, they, they set uh, three to five observable, measurable goals, and, uh, and then what they do is they use situational leadership, and they analyze what's the development level of the person on each of those goals, and they do that together, and what leadership style did you need? Because remember, you not only use with your people different strokes for different folks, you need to use different strokes for the same folks on different parts of their job. And how did Jesus learn how to be a leader? Well, he learned from his father when he was a carpenter. Because you don't hear much of him after he's 12 you know, years old, except a couple of comments, is he the, the carpenter's son or is he the carpenter and all. So I would assume he wasn't a sloppy carpenter. And so we got a bunch of carpenters together. And we said, how do you teach somebody to be a carpenter? Oh, he said, you have to move from novice to, a, to a apprentice to journeyman, to master teacher, which is like our four development levels of situational leadership. And so I assume that his father moved him through those things so that he became a good carpenter. And we went, duh, that's really interesting. That's where he learned how to be a leader from his father, learning and watching how his father taught him how to be a good carpenter. And so there's, a, there's some real power in, in that whole, whole thing. And uh, so... Uh, what we, we really try to do is, is say, how do you do that? So we set observable, measurable goals, analyze development level. Are you, if you want to use the, the carpenter's terms, are you, you know, a, a, a journeyman? Are you apprentice? Are you, a, you know, a beginner? Or where are you? What leadership style you need? So you not only need different strokes for different folks, you need different strokes for the same folks on different parts of their job. And then one of the most powerful things that we teach that they implement at WD-40 is most people don't know their people. And we tell you that at least once every two weeks, you ought to meet with each of your people individually for 15 to 30 minutes. You should schedule a meeting, and they should set the agenda. And this means the same way as a parent with your kids. With your kids, you might want to do it once a week. And all 15 to 30 minutes, you schedule a meeting, they set the agenda, and they can talk about anything they want, including a goal they're working on, they might have a problem and all. But if you met with your people and you met with each of your kids 26 times a year for half an hour and it was just focused on them, would you know what they were up to? Would they know you and all? You better believe it. Duh. And a lot of people say, well, I don't have time. I said, what are you doing? Even if you had 10 people reporting to you, if you can't you know, give five hours every two weeks for that, get a life. Go do something else. You're in too damn many meetings. And, uh, and so they implemented that. And then they have a really great thing is every manager meets once a quarter with each of their direct reports. And the first item of agenda is, is the final exam still relevant? In other words, they look at the goals that they establish and they say it's still relevant. What happens in a lot of organizations, if they set goals, what do they do? They file them until when? Somebody says, you got your annual performance review? Oh, everybody's running around trying to find the goals, you know? And a lot of times, you haven't worked on that goal in six months because you had a tsunami, you had an economic breakdown and all that. So they can change their goals all the way to the beginning of the fourth quarter. Duh. And then what's really interesting, and take this home, the stupidest thing is for you to sit there at the end of the year filling forms out in your people while they're sitting out there wondering how they score. Let them fill out the form. At WD-40, everybody only fills out one performance through their own. Why would you do that? And the job of the manager is to agree or disagree. 
Boy, that'll save you a lot of time. And it puts the ball in their court. Plus, you've met them 26 times a year, and so you're all going to know what's going on. And so uh, what they do in the quarterly meeting, they have, a, they have a report card that they have that's really neat. It says first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, overall performance. And each quarter, the direct report, they call them tribe members, comes in to that meeting. After they talk about whether the, the final exam is still relevant, they show them the report card. And for each of their goals, they give themselves an A, a B, a C, or an L. L means I'm still learning, so don't evaluate me. It's a new goal, OK? And now what's the job of the manager? To agree or disagree. And sometimes people will go into their first quarterly meeting with somebody, and they'll, they'll rate themselves really high because they worked at other organizations. And they said, man, if you don't rate yourself high, they're going to knock you down anyway. And so they come in and rate themselves, gives themselves all A, and the manager says, no, let's look at the data. I don't think that's an A. That's a good solid B, but I'd like to talk about how we could get it to an A. Some people rate themselves low because that's just, you know, they don't like to brag or anything. And the manager says, no, that's not a C. You know, that's a good solid B. How are we going to get it to an A? And uh, so they keep on doing that, you know, with them and they're working with it. What is the goal to get each of their people, what, an A average? Now, do you think that works? Now, this is an insider trader stuff. Look at the tax performance, I mean, the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the financial stuff and the Wall Street uh, thing on WD-40, because it's a public company, in the last number of years. And I want to tell you, the performance is really great. And then, just to show you the power of this, because I, didn't I say, it's the only way to get great results and great human satisfaction. Every 18 months, they pass out an employee satisfaction questionnaire. How many of you ever passed something out like that with your people? You know, some of you have. And if you get 50 or 60% return, that's pretty good. You know what they get at WD-40? They get at least 98% of the people return the form. And they're in 30 nations. The last time they gave it, 98.7 people who filled the form said, I am proud to tell people I work for WD-40. 98.5 said, at WD-40, I am clear on what I'm asked to do to be a high performer. I think 98.4 said, at WD-40, I'm getting the help I need to be a high performer. You know, what do you think? You know what their employee engagement score is? 92%. I don't know if you'll know much about employee engagement. That will blow your mind. 92% employee engagement. So what I'm telling you, this is powerful, powerful stuff. Unbelievable stuff. And in our Lead Like Jesus thing, what we do is after we teach about the heart, where we raise the questions, are you here to serve and serve and look with egos anonymous and all, then we talk about your being habits. Because what do you do to reinforce who you want to be in the world in terms of serving and, and being and your purpose and all that kind of thing? And we talk about what did Jesus do to keep on track? Solitude, you know? Uh, what did he do? After he was baptized, he went off for 40 days. That's a lot of solitude. You ever try that? He went off by himself after he found out that John the Baptist had been killed. Probably what to do, to deal with, with sadness and grief. Then he went off by himself after he fed the 500, probably to deal with ego because they wanted to make him king. My favorite one is he's doing a bunch of healing one day. And the disciples are really getting excited. This could be a really good business. And uh, uh, the next morning, it says, early in the morning, Jesus went off by himself to a solitary place to pray. When the disciples get up, they're running around looking for him. And they finally find him. And they say, Jesus, they're all waiting for you. Did he care about those people? Sure he cared about those people, OK? You know, most caring person in the world. But what did he say? No, let's go to the next village so I can preach. For that is why I have come. And see, if you don't take time in solitude and prayer, which is the second thing, of course, that he did, 
then you're going to get yourself off of purpose. I was telling the group earlier, we get caught in a rat race, you know, and we're, get up and we're, whoo, we're racing around, you know, and all this kind of stuff and all that, and we don't ever take any quiet time. You know, Rick Warren at the prayer breakfast spoke at night, and he said, here's three things that you ought to all do. One is you got to spend quiet time every day with the Lord. You know, you just got to do that. And second, he said, you got to spend time reading the Bible, preferably in a uh, small group. At Willow Creek, they got more people in small groups than attend church on Sunday. And then third, he said, you need to share the message of grace and hope in all of, of, of Jesus. But we need to take time to think through things so that we can be who we want to be uh, in the world. And so we, we talk about the habits of, of solitude, prayer, study of scripture. I got a kick out of the first time I read when Satan you know, tempted Jesus. He could have said, ah, get out of here. I'm number two at a minimum. What did he do every time he quoted scripture? So he knew the Bible. And he had a small support group. If you have a small support group, that's a really important thing. People can really be honest with you. And then the big picture one that covers it all is he trusted the unconditional love of God. And then after we talk about, and when, so that, those being habits are in between the heart and the, and the head. And then after the hands, which is how do you put this in, we talk about the doing habits of love and grace and forgiveness and all of those, how you get those in, into your life. So it's a really powerful thing. And so let me just tell you that that the people who experience a lead like Jesus encounter, and that's what we call it, it, they're not the same coming out because it's not a typical leadership program because it's all about Jesus and it's all about taking a look at yourself and seeing where it fits in uh, here. And we change the way a lot of people look at the world because a lot of people think that who they are, their self-worth is the function of their success and they think that that's a function of how much money they make how much recognition they get for their effort, and how, how much power and status they have. And let me tell you, there is nothing wrong with making good money, getting recognized for your effort, and having power and status. What's wrong is if you think that's who you are, and therefore, what happens, the only way you can maintain your self-worth is to either make more money, get more recognition, or more power. And we see leaders who run for positions I think very often, because that's how they fill that void. But if you focus on those, you're going to miss what Jesus wants us to do, which is significance. And what's the opposite of making money? It's generosity of what? Time, talent, treasure. And I like to add a fourth one, touch. What's the opposite of power and status? Uh, it's serving, service. And what's the opposite of uh, I mean, what's the opposite of recognition? It's service. What's the opposite of power and uh, status? It's loving relationships. And I love the movie Ghost. I don't know how many of you have ever seen that movie, but Patrick Swayze plays this guy who was killed by a supposed friend. And uh, uh, he gets to stay on earth as a ghost. And I know some of the religious writers, I don't like a movie with this ghost and all this kind of thing, but and it's a great movie. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> So uh, he gets to stay on earth to protect Molly, his girlfriend, who, uh, and he gets to communicate through Whoopi Goldberg, who plays this kind of, kind of clairvoyant uh, Oda May. And at the end of the movie, it's so powerful, the three of them, he's avenged his death, they're on the top of, of Molly's apartment, and all of a sudden this light comes towards them. And Oda May says, they're coming for you, Sam. And he looks at Oda May, he said, your mama would have been proud of you. And then he turns to Molly. If you ever saw that film, he never told Molly he loved her. Uh, Molly would say, Sam, I love you. And what would he say? Ditto. And now with tears coming down his eyes, he said, Molly, I love you. I always love you. And she's crying and she says, ditto. And then he turns to face the light and he stops one last time and he turns to Molly. He says, Molly, the remarkable thing about this is the only thing you can take out of here is love. And servant leadership, leading like Jesus, is love and action. And I want to challenge you to go out and love on your people 
and make a difference in both results and human satisfaction. And Jesus is the model. Bless you.